Hi, I'm Tiffany Patlin, host of the Tiffany Talks Health and Wellness Podcast, where I discuss tools, tips, and techniques to heal your mind, body, and soul. I am on a godly mission to heal the world. Tiffany Talks listeners, thank you for joining us today for this amazing episode with Miss Jenny Dent Brandt. She is a speaker and writer who grew up in the halls of power in Washington, D.C. She has battled cancer, ministered around the world, and served on the front lines of American culture as a counselor, educator, wellness advocate, and adjunct professor. She has two master's degrees from the University of South Carolina in elementary counseling and in education and research. She received her undergraduate degree from Columbia International University in biblical education. Thank you for joining us today, Jenny. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm really excited to hear more about what you have to share with our audience today. So to start, would you please just share with us how it is that you got into all of this great, amazing stuff that you've been doing? Well, it certainly wasn't planned. As a matter of fact, this gal was determined not to get cancer because there were high rates in my family. And I'd seen so much cancer around me that I was trying to be different and trying to do things differently. And I began to research with each relative or friend that got cancer, what I could do to prevent it. I even helped revamp the school lunch program in my school district and I educated every student at my school about good health. And if you asked anyone, any of the teachers at my school, they would tell you who eats the healthiest at our school, they would say it's Jenny Dent Brandt. Well, four months after my mother died from mm -hmm. breast cancer, I found after the Cooper River Bridge run, I had uh, run it, which meant I mainly walked it, uh, <laughs> mostly walking. It's a 10 kilometer run. I had done it that morning and that night, in the middle of the night, my ring got caught in my nighty, And as I tried to free it, it woke me up. I felt a lump in my breast. Now, I wasn't too concerned because honestly, I thought it was a dream. And the next morning when I checked, I said, oh, the lump is there. But lumps can be di many different things. So I still wasn't right. too concerned. I knew I wasn't high risk for breast cancer. There are certain cancers I am high risk for genetically, but that wasn't one of them. So I went to my doctor and she sent me to a radiologist and they did another mammogram and you know they could see it this time. And the first thing they said was, okay, it's not a fluid filled tumor this time, a fluid filled cyst. It is a tumor. We're going to have to do a biopsy. And the first bad news came when after the biopsy, they called me at school and they said, it's cancer. And then a week later, they called with more information from that biopsy and they said, it's not just cancer, it's aggressive oh, and it's estrogen fed and you will struggle to live. It's not going to be an easy journey. And then they got me prepared with an MRI to do the surgery. And when the MRI results came back, the doctor called me in his office. I was by myself. Every time I got bad news, I was by myself. And he says, Jenny, it's worse than we thought. It looks like it spread into your lymph nodes and other parts of your body which means stage four aggressive cancer. And he was honest with me. He said, we're going to do everything we can, pull out every weapon to save your life, but we cannot save it. We can only extend it a few years. Mm. That is, you know, news that nobody wants to hear. Devastating. And so I immediately went for a second opinion. My husband said, you know, we, we need a second opinion. I went to cancer treatment centers in Chicago. And when I arrived, they looked at me and they said, we know you're upset we saw the MRI and they said, don't jump off the bridge just yet. 
because we're going to have two surgeons and two radiologists look at it and give us feedback. And we're going to do more tests. And in five days, we're going to get back with you on our opinion. And in five days, I felt so much better. I felt like I had a chance to live. They said, we don't know that this cancer is all over your body. What we see all over your body on the MRI is inflammation caused from a bad biopsy that could have could have taken you out. And they said, you're fortunate that you are doing well, but we won't know whether it's stage four until we do the surgery. That was the best news anybody could have told me. And I do recommend everyone get a second opinion. But the doctors up there sat down with me and they said, there are eight risk factors for the breast cancer you got. They went through each of the risk factors. And they were shaking their heads and I was shaking my head because I didn't have any of them. They mm. said, well, it must be genetic since your mother just died from breast cancer. So we're going to do extensive genetic testing because it will help us in the decisions that we have to make together. They did the testing. It came back. Nothing. So here I am diagnosed with a, an aggressive and deadly cancer. I have no genetics or no risk factors for. Well, that, Tiffany, sent me on a quest to discover. Number one, what caused my cancer? And number two, what could I do to help my doctors beat it and lessen the side effects of all these treatments they were talking about that nobody really wants to go through, but I had to because of the situation I was in. So I began to study and research. I combed through God's word. I was trained as a researcher in my graduate degree, and I started going through the medical research. I studied books on how the body was created by God to work on an everyday basis. And I began to see things that I was doing that weren't listed by the American Cancer Society. But in time, it would be proven that these things certainly contributed to my cancer diagnosis. Now, I was so perturbed and so puzzled as to why I got this cancer. I went to meet with the chaplain in Chicago at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. And I said, I don't understand how a health nut like me got a deadly and aggressive cancer like this. And he said, Jenny, your doctors don't understand it either. But I will tell you this, your healthy lifestyle and your healthy habits don't stop now. They're going to get you through the journey. And then he looked at me and said, Jenny, you're a Christian speaker. You're an author. God can use this in your life for you to mm. to so many people. And I know you're thinking, Tiffany, I said, oh, yippee. I looked at him. I said, you don't understand. I don't want this gift. <laughs> Who would want yeah. such a gift to have to go through all this? But the more I learned and the more I realized that I was doing everyday things that should have been done differently, and I might not have gotten cancer, the more I felt the desire and the calling to educate other people, because I've been an educator all my life, so that other people can, number one, prevent cancer in the first place and not make the same mistakes I did. Right. Number two, I can get people through the journey. I have people call me all over the world that are in the middle of the cancer journey, and I can help them get through it. And the same eight steps that help you do both of those also help you once the doctors kill your cancer to help you to prevent it from coming back because no one like me in the cancer journey wants to ever hear that cancer diagnosis again. And there's no guarantee, but you can certainly make your chances better. Mm -hmm. So the book I didn't want to write, I told that chaplain, he said, I can see it now, your next book. And the first words in it are, this is the book I never wanted to write. Ooh. Well, I declared I would never write that book. I don't care what that chaplain said. And <laughs> here I am feeling led by God to write the book. And guess, Tiffany, guess what the first words in the book are? <laughs> this is my book I never wanted to write. <laughs> so here I am doing, you know, I retired from education and now I mentor cancer patients and I educate people so that they can hopefully, my main goal of doing all this is to prevent people from having to go down this road in the first place. I got to tell you this, this is a shocker. I didn't know until I was diagnosed. The cancer rates in 1970 were one in 10. And well, there were 1930, they were one in 30. Today, they are one in two. And it's predicted by 2030, they will be one in one. 
That means everyone will get one or more cancers in their lifetime. Now, do you believe that it's all hereditary or do you know that there's other contributing factors? Oh, I know now that it's not. Many years, the Cancer Society and many doctors felt, they didn't know at the time, that it was mainly beyond what you did. It's just something that happened to you. And that would be genetics, okay? And so now they know without a doubt, you ask MD Anderson, you ask major cancer researchers, they'll all tell you it's anywhere from 80 to 90% lifestyle. It is only 10, 15%, some say 5% genetics. So knowing that, you know, and, and with me not having any of the risk factors and them ruling out all the genetic factors, I had to keep looking. There was something that helped to cause my cancer. And I kept seeking and looking until I found it. You mentioned lifestyle. And personally, I believe that in order to live a healthy life, you got to focus on your mind, body, and soul. Like you got to focus in all three areas. Would you say that all of that, from your personal opinion and everything that you've done, would you say that all of that does encompass the lifestyle? It's not just how you eat. Right. It's not just how you eat. Your emotions, how you handle stress, your uh, your faith has a lot to do. I had a strong faith, but the point is when you go through stress and when you go through a cancer journey like this, how you handle it can determine, you know, with your faith, how well you're going to do in getting through all those tr- treatments. You fight with your mind and your spirit just as much as you do with your lifestyle and the medical practices brought in to help you to kill that that cancer. It's all of it together because it works synergistically. For example, if you go around poor, poor, pitiful me and the cancer journey and, and living, don't get me wrong, fear is part of the cancer journey and it does bring a lot of stress, but you can't live there every day. You have to learn to rely on your faith and manage that stress. And when you do that, you're more likely to do well and for your body, along with what the doctor's doing to kill those cancer cells, then if you go around living in fear every day and all stressed out about it and negative, I mean, they've clearly shown in the research, and I have several chapters on this in the book, that laughter actually promotes healing in the body. But grief, long-term grief, long-term stress and fear anger, all these things, they lessen the immune system. Well, that's our main defense against COVID, against cancer, against heart disease, against dementia, autoimmune conditions. So, you know, how you think, how you live your spiritual life, your mind, your body, and how you take care of it, the physical, it all works together. And you've got to get all three in tune to make it through the cancer journey. I really love the way that you explain that. And I would even, you know, add to that, that it's really how to get through anything in life, not just cancer. It's really right. how to get, it's really just simply how to live healthy and, and living without cancer is healthy. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is at the end of the book, I say, all right, I use these eight steps to get through the cancer journey, all backed up by medical research. And then I say, but actually these same eight steps I learned are the same things you do to prevent heart disease, dementia, which my father died from, Mm. autoimmune conditions, and to lessen, you know, if you were going through COVID, both my husband and I, people were concerned that COVID came around after I went through the cancer journey and all that chemo, that I would be high risk to have a terrible case. I got my immune system so well functioning as God intended. I went through COVID like a breeze and didn't even know I had it hardly. Oh, wow. So, you know, and I'm in that age category where I was considered, you know, high risk, especially being a cancer survivor. So, you know, it's just amazing when we take control of our health and we look what we can do physically, mentally and spiritually for our own help. When we listen to what the Bible says about these areas, I mean, the Bible is very clear. I look at what Paul said in Philippians 4, 6 through 8. When you go through trials in your life, as he was in prison going through a major trial, what's the first thing you do? It's the first thing we did in the cancer journey. Pray about everything. And then he said, give thanks 
in everything. And you're going, no, how can you give thanks for a cancer <laughs> journey? You look for everything you can be grateful for in the cancer journey. And then he clearly says, look on the good things. I'm just paraphrasing now. Look on the good things. And so all through this journey, I'm dwelling on all the things, good things that are happening. And I'm giving praise to God for everything. And I'm praying about everything. And do you know that helps the immune system to function more effectively? The research is clear. And so here God gives us these tidbits throughout scripture about taking care of your body. And we just we just don't see it sometimes, you know? I was blind to some things. And so I had to look back in my life and realize that 15 years of taking care of all four parents as they died on top of a full-time job, I grieved just almost 24 hours a day. I kept grieving. And then I discovered that long-term grief, not short-term, short-term's normal, but long-term grief where you just can't get out of the grief cycle. And it goes on and on and on for years and years and years can lower your immune system. Bingo. I found one of the reasons my immune system was lowered, which opened the door for me to get cancer. But that was just one of the many things that I discovered as I began to research and go to God and say, Lord, show me what I need to learn here. I'm here for a reason. Please show me what I need to learn. And things kept happening and things kept dropping on my doorstep, certain books and certain tests that doctors would order. And I'd go, oh my goodness, this is another reason why I got cancer. So there were reasons. There's there's always a reason. You don't get something like cancer just because you walked under a cloud at the wrong time, you know? Mm -hmm. So discovering why was important to me because I don't want it coming back. <laughs> yes. And I know a lot of times we go through trials and tribulations and we do get stuck in that. Why? Why? <laughs> why me? But I, I feel like it's just be patient, right? Would you say just be patient with the process because you will discover why? Would you agree with that? You'll discover why if you're searching for why. What I discovered in the medical profession today is most of the doctors don't want you to worry about why. They just treat you and don't ask any questions. And really, I don't think that's the best thing to approach things. If you go to the heart, a, a doctor, and he tells you, that you are high risk for a heart disease because your cholesterol is high. Don't just take the medicine. Ask what you can do to make your body healthier so your cholesterol can go down. You can always change your diet. You can increase hydration. You can exercise. There's all these proven things. You have to be a part of your own health. Mm -hmm. And you can't just go to the doctor and put everything on the doctor. You've got to be a part of the way you think, of your of, you know, managing your faith every day and using your faith to manage your emotions and the way you live and eat and move, the habits that you develop on an everyday basis, are they ones that are going to promote health in your body? And what a lot of doctors are dealing with today is they're having to give people six, seven, eight medications to lower their cholesterol and, um, and do all these things that their body would normally do if they had the right lifestyle. And they're not asking the doctor, what can they change and what can they do? They just say, doctor, 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 take care of this. Mm -hmm. People perish for lack of knowledge. That's right. So, you know, you've really got to be a part of your own health and no one cares more about your own health than you. Yes. Yes. Oh, boom. I love that. I love that so much. Um, so the title of your book, Unleash Your God-Given Healing, Eight Steps to Prevent and Survive Cancer. Um, I know we got, you know, the title of your book, so we kind of understand what it's about. But can you share with us a little bit about what people can expect once they get that book, once they start reading it? Well, one of the first chapters in the book, after you, you know, go through an introduction, begins with these eight things that I learned that can make a difference in preventing cancer, getting through the journey and preventing it from coming back. And the first one is hydration. So what we found basically, and this is just something known that doctors deal with all the time is that enough hydration benefits every single system and cell in your body. And the best thing you can do during the cancer journey or to prevent cancer to begin with is be properly hydrated on an everyday basis. And in the book, I go through exactly what that is. It's not what everyone thinks it is. What counts as hydration and what doesn't may not be what you think. But the important thing is that you stay properly hydrated and 
if you're like me and you have to go through chemotherapy, you want to increase hydration two days before, the day of, and two days afterwards. Probably the key that was just the most profound to me was exercise. No doctor, no nurse told me to do what I did. But after the first surgery, I got up and I wanted the tubes removed. And they said, well, the breast cancer tubes will be there for a few weeks. You'll go home with them. But the catheter we can move tomorrow morning. If you can walk four rounds of the hospital floor at 6 a.m., I said, you're on. I, I'll, I'll, I'm ready to go. I want this tube out. Well, I didn't walk four rounds that day. I walked two miles on the hospital floor. Wow. And the nurses were cheering me on. And they finally called my doctor and said, should we stop, Miss Branch? She's keeping on <laughs> dragging those poles behind her. And they said, no, 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 no. As long as she has the energy and balance, you let her go. It'll only promote healing in her body. It's the best thing she could do. I got to go home a day early. I had no breast tubes. They were taken care of by the exercise in the hospital. And the doctor said, you would not believe the healing you promoted in your body. Well, when it came to chemo, I said, OK, well, that worked for me there. What if I walk two miles before chemo and two miles afterwards? Mm. So two miles before is OK. You haven't had the chemo yet. I'll do what I can. If, you know, if I can, I was able to walk two miles after chemo. And then every day in between, and I walked throughout the chemo journey. I climbed mountains. I did the Cooper River Bridge run, walking, of course. But the point is, I now have cancer patients, and I tell them the best thing you can do is to move. Plus, you're holding your, your bone density, which goes down when you go through all these cancer treatments. So movement has now been proven after I went through the cancer journey by the Australian research and now research at MD Anderson with them saying it's the best thing a cancer patient can do. Now, it prevents cancer to begin with because your bodies were made to move on a daily basis. And then when you're in the cancer journey, instead of all those toxins building up in your system, you're constantly keeping them moving and pushing them out your lymphatic system. And so they it helps them do their job and then it helps them to move out of your system with the hydration. So there are just all these things that we can do to take what the doctor's doing and make it more efficient. So uh, don't go to your doctor and sit there and go, all right, doctor, kill my cancer. This is the way I looked at it. What can I do to help my doctor to kill my cancer? He's killing it from the outside. What can I do from the inside? Because my doctor doesn't control my lifestyle. I, I'm in an area here that only I can do something about. You know, when you were explaining that, I was thinking of that that quote, that statement, um, a stagnant body promotes disease. Absolutely. So that's why you got to get your body moving. And that's then right. the other um, point that you had mentioned about how laughter, you know, will build your immune system. And it's true. Like you said, we shouldn't be thinking all these negative thoughts and live there and, you know, just all that darkness, because um, whatever the mind believes it will achieve. That's another, you know, fame part of a famous quote. So if you're focusing on the gratitude, like you mentioned, which I agree it is, it's scientifically proven. So any skeptics out there, go, go research or just read her book, <laughs> read her book. She has it all in there. Um, it really does work. And I would just encourage everybody to do this, whether you have cancer or not, because like you've been mentioning, you know, Miss Brandt about how it's to prevent it. Right. Right. Who wants to go down? Trust me, once they give you that diagnosis, all these doors open that you do not want to have open. And it's just like it was like a nightmare. I couldn't wait. I kept waking up and saying to my husband, do I have cancer or am I just in the middle of a nightmare? And he said, no, honey, you have cancer. I mean, you don't want to be in that in that nightmare if you can prevent it on the front end. And yes, you can with the rates going up as they have. I mean, it's clearly lifestyle. And what we are doing with some genetics mixed in. Well, I couldn't blame the genetics. So for me, it was totally lifestyle, you know, and I had a healthy lifestyle. So I thought there were certain things that I certainly could improve. And, you know, one of the other things I learned, the last thing I learned, the eighth step is to heal your gut. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I went through chemotherapy, which totally destroyed my gut. It should have been the first thing I learned. No, it's the last thing I learned, but I learned it in time to protect my gut during the end of chemotherapy. And I totally rebuilt my gut after the chemotherapy was over. And my immune system was back up and running like normal in six weeks instead of two, three, four, five years. So it, my doctors were amazed. They called me their rock star 
cancer patient. They said, it's clearly what we're doing combined with what you're doing. You need both. But here, what's what I'm trying to say to people in this book is you be a part of the solution. Don't put it all on your doctor. You're going to get a much better result when you have the right lifestyle and the right mindset and your doctor's doing everything that they can too. Oh, that almost sounded like a really good ending because usually I ask people, what's one thing you want to say to the audience? So I'm just going to ask you if you have something else, because I just want to pull out the gold and give it to people. That was really good. Um, because like you even say, our bodies were created to fight disease. So if there's a person that maybe is on the beginning of their healing journey or, you know, their cancer journey, forgive me. Um, what is something that you would say to them to just encourage them? Because maybe they're angry. Maybe they're upset and frustrated, stressed. Maybe they're in that place and they're just like, yeah, right. You know, what could you say to that person that might empower them, motivate them, inspire them and encourage them to start taking this God-given power into their own hands and start changing their, you know, potential outcome? Well, the amazing thing that most people don't know is that our bodies were designed by God to detect and destroy cancer cells every single day when we put these lifestyle changes in place because our bodies were created to heal and regenerate on a daily basis. And the, when people call me and say, I'm afraid to go through the chemo, but the doctor says, if I don't, I'm not going to make it. Then I say, OK, realize when you go through the chemo, there are things you can do to support it. But when it's over, your body is going to heal and regenerate because that's the way God created it to work. And so I think when people realize that a lot of people, it helps them to go through the chemo because they realize, OK, I can do something about this. I can get to the end. And even though I look weak and frail, if I do the right things, my body is going to heal and regenerate itself because that's the way God created it to work. And when you realize how God so intricately created our body to work and what he gave us so it would be healthy. He says in Genesis 129, these are the foods I've given you to eat. And what are they? They are plants. What are we eating the least of today in America? Plants. What God gave us that have all these phytochemicals and antioxidants and fiber and all these things nourish our gut and keep our immune system strong. And we're eating everything else but so when you realize that God created all these things and called it good, and he did give us instructions to take care of our health, and he created our body with all these built-in abilities to heal, that gives you confidence in your body that, you know, I can get through this and come out on the other side healthier. Yes, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing those golden nuggets with us today. It was a real pleasure to have you on today. Great to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks. And to all you listeners out there, I encourage you to get um, her book. You can access that through her website amongst so many other things, her blog and everything else. And just reach out. I'm sure she's there to support you. She has this heart to educate and she's been there. She's been there, done that. So I encourage you to get that book. Feel free to leave a comment with anything that resonated with you or any questions that you have. And we will see you on the next episode. Bye now. 